Hey guys, I have an exciting announcement to share with you today. Until now, you could only listen to Future Hindsight on the internet or on a podcast app. Well, that's about to change. Starting this week, Future Hindsight is hitting the airwaves on community radio station KOWS 92.5 in West Sonoma County, California. If you're in the area, I hope you'll listen to our special one-hour episodes every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Check out kows92-5.org. And if you know of a local station near you that could use some new hard-hitting interviews like ours, please reach out to us and we'll work on a partnership. Thanks again for listening and supporting the podcast. It means so much to us here. We're so grateful to be able to reach you every week. Keep safe and stay engaged. Welcome to Future Hindsight. I'm your host, Mila Atmos. Each week, I speak with citizen changemakers who spark civic engagement in our society. Our guest today is Alice Marwick. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Communication and faculty affiliate at the Center for Media Law and Policy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, as well as a faculty advisor to the Media Manipulation Project at the Data and Society Research Institute. She focuses on the social, political, and cultural implications of popular social media technologies and studies far-right online subcultures and their use of social media to spread misinformation. During this pandemic time, accompanied by urgent calls for equity and justice and a presidential election, I wanted to find out if social media can actually build a movement, build real political power, and if a solid social media presence can help win elections. I think Black Lives Matter is the epitome of what we would call hashtag activism in that it's really a native social media activist movement. The movement started when trying to bring awareness to the deaths of Black people and acts of police brutality that were not being covered by mainstream media. That social media became a platform to push these events into mainstream consciousness and to try to get people to pay attention to them. And let's be clear, this has been a long process coming. You know, these people who are involved in Black Lives Matter have been agitating for years to get these things on the national agenda as they are now. We talk about the role of social media in political power building movements, such as from hashtag activism like Black Lives Matter, and the more extensive use of social media by all politicians during this election cycle due to COVID-19. We recorded this conversation in the summer, well before the president himself contracted COVID. So perhaps social media will now matter even more in these coming weeks leading up to election day. Let's listen in. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be here. I'm interested in political power building and the role of social media and or online communities in this process, especially now in the time of COVID and Black Lives Matter and taking in everything essentially online. What was the defining breakthrough practice in social media for the Trump campaign in 2016? Because I think that's for us, for most people in popular lore where we feel like, oh, wait, what happened? What do you think? The thing about President Trump is he already had this extremely strong social media presence that was notorious for years before he became a candidate. And he was very, very tied into current news cycles and sort of outrage cycles on social media, cable news, legacy media, things like that. So you have a candidate who doesn't have to learn how to do that stuff, who's already using these tools to connect with a constituency who's then able to transform that from a sort of fandom into a set of potential voters. And I think that that's a really big difference between Trump and a lot of other contemporary politicians, especially in his generation. 
Yeah, as you said, he has a large following and uh, I've been living in New York for a long time. And so we have always known him to be this master manipulator of the media, always putting himself on page six in the New York Post or even other local newspapers where we read about Trump all the time. And for the rest of the country, it was a little bit different. But what are the things that we can learn from his campaign, the way he did it, in terms of what we can do today in this environment, because nobody can really stump in person? That's a good question. Many of the more traditional forms of political address are off the table, given the COVID pandemic. You have this sort of limited set of channels through which politicians are able to communicate with the public. And some politicians like AOC are really effective at doing that, right? Like they are able to harness social media like Twitter or Instagram or Instagram Live, in AOC's case, to sort of humanize themselves, put forth their political positions, appeal to their constituents, and build a broader base. Other people are not so good at that. You know, Joe Biden's campaign has not really, I think, taken advantage of the participatory affordances of the social lab. But on the other hand, some people might say that that prevents him from making the types of gaffes that he's historically made when doing these in-person events. I think this really does favor incumbents and people who are known quantities, whereas more traditionally, you have these sort of up and coming young politicians who'd be doing all this glad handling and kissing babies and whatnot just to kind of get their name out there. And that's not going to be possible. So the people who can do a good job of, you know, creating catchy ads on YouTube or having a fun Twitter account or doing a good job of going on political podcasts or things like that, I think those are the ones who can get attention and sort of build a following for themselves, even without the in-person political events that we've become accustomed to. I kind of want to go back to the work that you've done on the alt-right, because I think they were instrumental in helping Trump get elected and sort of draw a parallel of maybe what's possible for Black Lives Matter right now. I heard on the radio yesterday that the defining difference between the civil rights movement of the 60s and demands for equity for Black lives now is that everybody's on social media and everybody can see what's happening as opposed to waiting for the newspaper. Do you think there is an opportunity for Black Lives Matter or police reform, you name it, right in this moment in terms of using social media to advance their cause? Absolutely. I think Black Lives Matter is the epitome of what we would call hashtag activism in that it's really a native social media activist movement. The name of the movement, Black Lives Matter, is a hashtag. The movement started when trying to bring awareness to the deaths of Black people and acts of police brutality that were not being covered by mainstream media. That social media became a platform to push these events into mainstream consciousness and to try to get people to pay attention to them. And let's be clear, this has been a long process coming. You know, these people who are involved in Black Lives Matter have been agitating for years to get these things on the national agenda as they are now. Right now, we're in a really interesting position because a great deal of people who are not those core original members or the core people who marched in like 2014 or 2015 are still showing a great deal of support for Black Lives Matter on social media. So there's these kind of low overhead actions that people can do. They can retweet a message about Black Lives Matter. They can change their profile picture on Facebook. They can post an Instagram story that shows their support for Black Lives Matter. And these might not be people who would go to a protest or who would necessarily donate money to a bail fund, but it creates this sort of sense of consensus and this idea of a very broad movement with a wide, wide social base. And so you can still consider yourself a supporter of Black Lives Matter, even if you're not doing what we would think of as traditional forms of political participation. And I think that's very advantageous because it shows how much grassroots support there really is for things like police reform, bail reform, changes in 
accountability laws for policing, things like that, that these really are issues that are not fringe issues. They're not far left issues. They're not just black issues. They're issues that do have a broad base of support. Making that visible is one of the great advantages of social media activism. What do you think is the sort of like the tipping point for how social media can bring a grassroots movement into the foreground? Like what kind of traction does it need to get in order for people to be like, wait, that actually matters. We have to pay attention. I think it's really dependent on the issue at hand and what else is going on in the news cycle. I don't think you can necessarily design a campaign or duplicate a campaign to have political significance. You know, there are dozens, hundreds, thousands of incidents that people call out on social media or hashtags that are political that people try to promote that don't have the kind of uptake that Black Lives Matter or Me Too have had. And so it's partly like trying to design an advertisement to go viral. To a certain extent, there's something that's like ineffable about it. With Black Lives Matter, I think it's the accumulation of these acts over and over and over again, seeing the killing of all of these Black people, and then also the consistency of these protest events that have also been going on where people are getting out into the community in person. And that's happening again and again for years on end. You know, there's ebbs and flows in it, but you really see sort of a critical momentum coming to pass. I think it's a combination of sustained attention, of there being sort of key events in the news and the more traditional news cycle that do tie into the activist campaign. And also just what is the political climate otherwise? Like right now, we're in a point of time where there's been a vast increase in left wing activism since 2016. A lot of people are very unhappy with how the right wing establishment has handled the pandemic. And people are very frustrated and angry because they are been stuck inside for months. So there's this sort of critical mass of different factors that I think contribute to it. It's also worth saying that we might not fully understand all of this for several years. Sometimes it requires hindsight to really understand the significance of a current moment. Yeah, that's definitely true. Today's episode of Future Hindsight is sponsored by The Jordan Harbinger Show. Jordan's show, which Apple named one of its best of 2018, is aimed at making you a better informed, more critical thinker so you can get a sense of how the world actually works and come to your own conclusions about what's happening, even inside your own brain. Every week, Jordan interviews people with something interesting to teach you and his questions are designed to maximize those lessons. You never quite know who you're going to be listening to, but Jordan's been in the podcast game for a long time, and I can safely say there's something in his archives for everyone. If you like Future Hindsight, I think you'll enjoy The Jordan Harbinger Show too. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also find the show at jordanharbinger.com. In terms of this raw footage that we see today when people are protesting or being civically engaged in some sense, how can we actually make it a force for good in terms of being, you know, good citizens? When you're talking about footage from protests, you're often talking about footage that there's a very real possibility that will be run through facial recognition systems or it will be used by government agencies to go after people. The extent to which government agencies like ICE use social media data is just completely unknown. We know that ICE is looking through social media to try to identify potentially undocumented people. But what we don't know is how people are getting access to that, whether they're getting access to it through the government or through the social media platform themselves. Sometimes governments are buying that information from private data brokers. And because there's a lack of regulation, there's no requirement that you're ever notified. You could go to a protest, have somebody use their cell phone to capture you at the protest on video, and that could be used in a criminal case against you several years down the road. And because there isn't legal protections and people aren't aware of the extent of this data collection, and also there's new tools and new technologies being developed 
constantly without any kind of oversight in terms of ethics or how they should be used. You get into a position where people are having to try to predict how data might be used or how it might be combined with other data years down the road. And that's just not a realistic requirement for anybody. We should be able to peaceably assemble and make our political beliefs and desires known without worrying that it might come back to haunt us years from now or without having to worry that that might get combined with data we've provided in some other context to hurt us in some other way. And obviously the people who are most vulnerable in other ways, like people who are poor or don't have a lot of educational resources or people of color, queer people are going to be the most likely to be affected by these shifts and changes in technologies. So in what way has social media changed our relationship to politics? Oh, that's a big question. Social media has opened up ways for us to participate in politics. And it's also opened up the types of information we can know about political issues. If you think about the pre-social media era, most information about what's going on vis-a-vis government, politics, current events, is coming from mainstream legacy media. And that's like a very limited set of sources. They're often very controlled. They gatekeep the kinds of information that are available to people. They often rely heavily on official sources. So with social media, you have the ability to read eyewitness accounts of things and see, you know, cell phone videos of protests or police brutality or sexual harassment or things like that. You are able to see political speeches as they happen. You get to interpret them yourselves rather than reading what the New York Times or USA Today has to say about them. But at the same time, social media has allowed for an enormous amount of misinformation and disinformation and what we call hyper-partisan media, which is media that covers current events with a heavy ideologically biased spin. So you have to be a little bit more careful about what you trust on social media because a lot of the markers that we used to use to assess the credibility of information are completely different or they're missing. Social media has also sped up the news cycle enormously in the same way that the shift from newspapers and the nightly news to 24-7 cable news really affected the types of events that were covered and the frequency of coverage, social media, which is 24-7, 365, never ends. It changes the types of things that people talk about, but it also creates a sense, I think, of information overload or what people call doom scrolling, where you're just going through a Twitter feed or the New York Times or something. It's just bad story after bad story, negative after negative. So I think a lot of these things have really changed the way that we process information that's civic or political, as well as the types of things that we believe we can do about it. You can use social media to voice your opinion, to participate in a hashtag campaign, to sign a petition, to connect with other people, to learn about political issues. And some of these ways of participation look very different from more traditional forms like voting or going to a political protest. That's a good answer. But let me ask you this question then. How has the use of social media progressed since the 2016 election And in what way is this race so far different than 2016, just on the social media side? I think it's impossible to disentangle social media and legacy media at this point, because so much of what traditional media covers is based on what's trending on social media. And so many journalists are deeply tied into social media. Also, although a lot of people do get their news from social media, still most people get their news from TV to be honest. So we have to think about this as a media ecosystem rather than social media versus legacy media. But since 2016, I think there's been a real reckoning by a lot of media people, whether they're in native digital media or 
traditional journalism about the way that the 2016 campaign was covered. You know, we're starting to see journalists be much more likely to call out blatant lies that politicians might say. Social media companies are starting now to label content as disinformation or misinformation, even if it's coming from a high profile elite politician. These are big differences. I think people are starting to shy away from using terms like inappropriate or racially divisive. And now they're like, no, that was racist. Like, we're going to say it. There's a sense that there needs to be a little less of this beating around the bush and more being clear about when politicians are lying or when there's manipulation going on, we're going to call it out. In 2016, also, the alt-right was really, really effective at pranking the media and getting their stories and their news frames into the media. And I think a lot of people recognized that that was overall quite bad and that this was a very small number of people who should not have gotten the type of coverage that they did, and it shouldn't have had the impact that it did. So I think more journalists now are aware of when they're covering fringe groups, there's ways to to do that responsibly or irresponsibly, and people are much more careful about covering it responsibly. Similarly, we know that a lot of misinformation, disinformation, and hoaxes originate on social media, and I think people are much smarter now about which of those hoaxes they're going to amplify, how much time they're going to give to such things, and whether or not they let that type of information spread beyond social media. Because it's it's one thing if something's trending on Twitter. It's another thing if the New York Times is covering it. Oh, for sure. Yes, very different. So as an everyday person... How can I behave responsibly when it comes to politics on social media? I think there's a lot of different ways that people can behave vis-a-vis politics on social media. I think if you don't want to interact with politics on social media, that's a perfectly legitimate option. But I guess my number one thing would be trying to discourage people from sharing inflammatory stories if they're not sure that they're true. And I'd also like people to think twice before participating and socially shaming on the internet. Now, this is where you get into really tricky things because there are certainly people who do terrible things that are only amplified because of social media, and it's through that amplification that they're held accountable. But this is a tactic that's used by both the left and the right, and it can really have consequences that I don't think any of us want, like people getting death threats or people getting swatted or things like that. So I would say being careful about spreading incorrect information and just kind of taking a moment before you blast somebody on social media for something that you want to shame them for. So on balance, would you say that social media has been good for democracy? There's a lot of things that have been much worse for democracy than social media, like gerrymandering or voter suppression. Those have far more significant consequences negatively for people's ability to participate in an egalitarian way in the political process, right? Like the systematic disenfranchisement of African-American men, I think, is very anti-democratic. There's been a lot of attention to social media as a sort of scapegoat for a lot of other things that have gone wrong in this country over the last decade or so. And obviously, they're very easy targets. They're these incredibly huge, wealthy corporations run by usually young white guys. I'm by no means defending many of Facebook's terrible choices. But when we look at what's fundamentally undermining our democracy, it's not people talking to each other on social media. It's not even tech companies getting rich off people talking about social media. It's stuff like the use of dark money in politics and lobbying and the fact that to get into Congress now, you have to be a millionaire. So I'd like people to think about the political system a little bit more holistically. And rather than isolating actors like social media companies, look at what it is that they represent structurally, right? Which is often economic inequality and the inability of people to trust institutions because they've been, in many cases, betrayed by those same institutions for decades. So I don't necessarily know I would say social media has been bad or good for democracy. I certainly think it's opened up the number of 
diverse voices who can participate in politics. And for that, I think it's a great thing. Of course, it also does have its downsides. Right. Yeah. Nothing is uh, only one way, right? There are two sides to every coin. And I agree with you that, of course, systematic disenfranchisement matters a whole lot more for our democratic process. So last question, looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? I think the sea change around recognition of systemic racism has been very heartening in the last few months, but it remains to be seen whether that's going to have long lasting impact. I like what I'm seeing from Gen Z kind of trolling on TikTok and things like that, trying to kind of mess things up and do their direct political actions like buying up tickets to the Trump rallies. You know, that's encouraging for the time being, but we'll see. There's broad recognition of things that when I was growing up were really only articulated in like far left communities or in feminist communities or in queer communities, for example, that now there's much more wide recognition of their importance. But, you know, it remains to be seen. If you'd asked me in 2015 whether I would have seen 2020 this way, I would have been horrified (laughs) to see what has happened this year. So, you know, it's hard to predict. Definitely, we did not anticipate for this year to turn out this way. No, a pandemic. And yeah, that that was probably last on my uh, prediction card. Yeah. Right. Yes, exactly. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being on Future Hindsight. And thank you for your scholarship. Oh, thanks for speaking with me today. I started this interview with the question of whether social media can build a political movement. The answer is definitely yes. Black Lives Matter is proof that social media activism works, though perhaps it doesn't work in the way we normally think of power building. The value of mainstreaming the recognition of systemic racism and revealing the widespread support for change is perhaps only truly quantifiable from a future vantage point. One caveat I would like to add here is that the accompanying protests in the streets and the footage of brutality against protesters have been instrumental in strengthening the cause. So it isn't purely social media alone. Still, the prevalent use of social media has changed our political discourse and the way we think about what's possible when we demand accountability and better governance. Next week, our guest is Nathan Stoltzfus. He's the Dorothy and Jonathan Rintels Professor of Holocaust Studies in the Arts and Sciences and Professor of History at Florida State University. He's also the author of Hitler's Compromises, Coercion and Consensus in Nazi Germany. Fascism is so important for the 20th century because before then, dictators, autocrats had appealed usually to family legacy. But since the French Revolution, at least, the people expected to have a say in politics. This is why uh, Hitler is modern in that very important aspect that he wanted to include the people and be representing himself as presenting the will of the people. And this was not so important in previous autocracies. In fact, we can say that Hitler was one of the pioneers of the kinds of popular autocracies we see today in the 21st century. We talk about the role of legitimacy, popularity, and even protest in building, maintaining, and exerting political power. Until next time, stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos. Thank you for continuing to listen to Future Hindsight. Our executive producer is Mila Atmos. The audio producer is Peter Fedak. And our associate producers are Miriam Zumbul and Brooke Sayan. Be sure to listen to us on Apple Podcasts, futurehindsight.com, or wherever you enjoy podcasts every week. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.